1986, The Apprentice Appears, The White Book by Machiavelli, Episode 17. This is a 20-page chapter. It's one of the larger chapters in the book thus far. It's jam-packed with information. This chapter is divided into two major sections. The first part is Naz's section on Islam and bonding with AZ. And the second part is Tupac's section on Eastern philosophy of the Indian tradition. The chapter begins with the city, which is a passage from the Quran, I believe. It mentions how there will never be another summer like the summer of 1986. In 1986, I was seven, and all I really remember about it is the Mets were in the World Series and the Giants were in the Super Bowl. And I also went to the Grand Prix for the first time that year. QB, Queensbridge. We learn that Benny the Winehead is, has died. And we get a narrative of Malik, who is Nas, of his life transitioning into a teenager. And there's a recollection of negative racist remarks that may have impacted his self-esteem and his self-concept. as reminiscent of the intro to Juicy. To all the teachers that told me I'd never amount to nothing, and to all the people that lived above the buildings that I was hustling in front of that called the police on me whenever I was just trying to make some money to feed my daughter. The projects in war. Malik decides the way out of the projects is through money. There's discussion of the nonstop war between neighborhoods and how it was an externalization of the anger people had within themselves about themselves onto others, and which could be the result of negative words spoken to children about not amounting to anything and having those negative thoughts manifest as the child reaches an age where he starts to blossom into the factors that nurtured him from his environment. In this case, negativity makes more negativity, and negativity on a large scale turns into war. What you put into the children, you will reap what you sow. Negativity breeds negativity. Plant seeds of positivity and shower them with positivity. So spread love. It also mentions that Nas surmises that all wars are interconnected. The backdrop is the Karis one the bridges over reference. And what I mean by it being the backdrop is, as it was saying, 86 was hot, the war is on, the bridge is over, essentially started all the rap beef for the five boroughs. And it's all, the lyrics to it are also excerpt 27, so let's take a look. Manhattan keeps on making it, Brooklyn keeps on taking it, Bronx keeps creating it, and Queens keeps on faking it. The next excerpt is what Nas was listening to when AZ first showed up. The selection is fitting in that Nas does not want to spend the rest of his life in the projects and the way to get out is through money and that the backdrop of a war going on in the lyrics to the song is referencing war, being a soldier, and he doesn't want to spend the rest of his life being that. And if we take a look at the rest of the lyrics, we'll see that it says, I don't want to spend my time in hell looking at the walls of a prison cell. I don't ever want to play the part of a statistic on a government chart. Nas meets AZ. They kick knowledge of Islam, gods and earths, and hip-hop while smoking fillies. The earth and the moon are one, and we the suns. I only call you that if you shine like one. The reference I heard this was from Wu Gambino's, which was on Raekwon the Chef's album, but it was like the whole Wu-Tang Clan on the song. And uh, Method Man says on the chorus, I call my boy son because he shine like one. Nas lets Ill Will know that AZ is good people, and lets AZ know that Ill Will is Nas's right-hand man. So they kind of join forces at that point. The five pillars of Islam. Shahada, which is faith in one God. Salat, pray towards the east five times a day. Zakat, is charity, purification, and growth. Psalm, fasting for closer union with Allah. Hajj, trip to the Kaaba or the square house during the 12th month. And this was when AZ or Nas, I can't remember who was questioning who on their knowledge of the five pillars. Muhammad, 
Muhammad is the beloved of God, the prophet, and the joy of creation. Born around 570 in Mecca, the jewel. Mecca is where Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. Muhammad was orphaned around six. He went to live with his grandfather, and then when his grandfather died, he went to live with his uncle Talib. Bahira, a Christian monk, knew Muhammad would be a prophet because a cloud kept shadowing Muhammad regardless of the time of day. Bahira, I think I remember that name from a previous chapter. Muhammad continued. Muhammad married Khadija and had children. When he was about 40, the angel Jibreel came to him on Mount Hira and told him to recite in the name of thy Lord. He didn't know how to read, so he asked Waraqwa what to do. She told him the message had to come from Allah, so he should go into trances where the verses would just come to him and others could write them down. Like speaking in tongues. This would become the Holy Quran. In 613, Muhammad began teaching submission to Allah. In 620, he had another true vision. Angel Jibreel sent him to Jerusalem, and he rode on a winged stallion all the way to heaven. A winged stallion all the way to heaven. So the way I interpret that is the winged stallion is some form of a UFO. All the way to heaven, I'm assuming that means he flew to space. And I'm assuming that would be an ET encounter, and he achieved knowledge and wisdom. Muhammad's Demise and Rise, 622, the Muslim calendar starts. Leaders in Mecca get fed up with him and ran him off to Yathrib or Medina. This exile is what led to Islam really taking off. Muhammad gathered an army of around 10,000, and in 630 they rode into Mecca and took it over. They turned the polytheism into monotheism. That's the belief in many gods into one god. He told believers in Islam to pray toward the Kaaba instead of toward Jerusalem. Then he forever closed the city to non-believers. He died two years later in 632. And then the trouble starts in 632. 632, the trouble begins. Arabia. June 8th, Muhammad dies at Medina at the age of 63 after an illness and fever. He was succeeded as head of the Muslims by Abu Bakr, the first caliph of the Rashidun Caliphate. Rida Wars, Rida Wars. Abu Bakr launches a series of military campaigns against rebel Arabian tribes to reestablish the power of the rightly guided caliphs and to secure Muhammad's legacy. September, Battle of Buzaka. An Islamic column, 6,000 men, under Khalid ibn al-Walid defeat the, ap the apostate rebels under Tulaya near Hail, Saudi Arabia. December, Battle of Akraba. Muslim forces of Abu Bakr defeat the apostate rebels, 40,000 men, under Musa Liyima on the plain of Akraba. Yeah, my bad on all those pronunciations. And this leads to the breakup into two uh, sects. One is the Sunni Muslims and the Shiite Muslims. So we'll start with the Sunni Muslims. Bak Bakr, Bakr was one of Muhammad's earliest converts. Bakr was responsible for bringing many nobles from Mecca over to Islam. He was elected caliph and ruled until his death in 634 when he appointed Omar as leader of the Abbasid Caliphate. And since then, they have become to be known as Sunni Muslims. So I'm guessing that's the ones that sided with Bakr. The Shiite Muslims. Ali, a cousin of Bakr and Muhammad, was with him on the first Hajj in 622. Supporters of Ali, the fourth and last of the righteous caliphs, believe that Muhammad chose him as successor, and they refer to sources which state the same. In Muhammad's first public sermons, he is reported to have said, Ali is my brother, my executor, and my successor among you. Hearken unto him and obey him. Ali was the second Muslim convert following Khadija and was married to Muhammad's only surviving child. Their bloodline is known as the Imams, people of the house. They are the Fatimad Caliphate known as the Shiite Muslims. And then it goes back to Naz and AZ's storyline. Life's a bitch. Malik recounts the story of Rocky the cop killing fish. 
and it says he turned from the vapors right there in front of everybody and there was a lot of lines in this chapter that remind me of the song life's a bitch by Nas and AZ from the Illmatic album so let's check the snippet Because, yeah, we were beginners in the hood as 5%ers. 7 er, 12er, 5%er. AZ mentions that he's a 5%er. 5%ers five teach science, supreme mathematics, supreme alphabet. Clarence 13X founded the Allah School and based it on principles from the Nation of Islam, W.D. Fard, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. 85%, 10%, 5% from the lost found Muslim lesson number two. 85% are those without the knowledge, headed for self-destruction. Headed for self-destruction. 10% are the agents. They got knowledge and power, but they use it to cast spells on the 85%. The remaining 5% are the poor righteous teachers. The 5% mission is to rescue the 85%. The 10% is growing, and in 10 years, there will be agents everywhere. Think of Matrix Reloaded when Agent Smith reproduced himself so many times. A is, A-Z, speaks on Africans. Africans are the original people of this planet. They aren't the original people of all planets, gods and earths. And that fathers and mothers of civilization and Islam is our original monotheistic religion. Science is the key. Teach science to the kids. They're the future. They need to be nurtured and protected so that they can grow to be self-sufficient as a nation. This is what the five percenters are trying to do. AZ briefly speaks on Jay-Z's commission. Yeah, I did a few capers with the commission, but I don't roll with them anymore. Characters of the Nas section. Malik Nas. Malik is Nas, obviously, by now you know that. A is, is AZ. Sirius, Bill, Fatima, Ms. Versi, Khan, Aisha, Store Owners, Fish, Rocky the Cop, and Sheila. And before we get into the Tupac section, I'm going to leave the Nas section with uh, something that Red Eyes had brought to my attention. A couple, a couple Nas little things that he found in his research. So there's a song called Smokin' by Nas, and the lyrics go, My buddy smokes with one lung. If he coughs, he might die. Passing me trees, the liquor bottle's almost empty. We're about to collide with the enemy. Only way you die, if it's meant to be. You're messing with the general. So he references the general in the same verse where he's talking about somebody smoking with one lung. And the song seems to be like he's chilling with Tupac after death, and that's death in quotations. And that they were going to ride on someone together, possibly Jay-Z. Possibly the enemies called out on Don Cluminati, Seven Day Theory. Or it could be that maybe he's going to finish off the job on killing off Tupac. Because they're on a boat, I think. I don't know. Who knows? But those lyrics are, are interesting. If anybody has any other insight on the song, what they think it's about, drop that in the comments. Another thing is the album cover for Hip Hop is Dead. There's a black rose, and it's on the Hip Hop is Dead cover, and Nas is kind of like putting it down. It's either him paying respects to Hip Hop dying, or it's like the the black rose saying, I finished the job, I it, it's done. Uh, is dead. I've always wondered what Hip Hop is Dead, the title by Nas, what, what, what did that mean? It's got to have a significant meaning. I don't think he's just saying that Hip Hop is Dead, he's too deep. You know, like a lot of rappers nowadays are pissed off at modern day current state of hip hop. But at the time when Nas put that out, I don't think he was just, you know, complaining. I think it had a meaning. If anybody has any insight, drop it. Not, there's another song called Nas Not Going Back, the first verse. Nas says, I know who died before the body dropped. I know the guns that was used and how much money the shooter got. So, I don't know. Is he talking about... Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, just some random shooting. I don't know. But it's a curious line. And thanks to Red Eyes for bringing this to my attention. If anybody has any additional info, drop it. 
Finally, we close the Nas section with cultural references. Karis One, Jam Master J, Adidas, Lee's, La Tigra Shirt, Arabs and Liquor Stores, 7 Up, Supreme, Fat Cat, Freeway Ricky Ross, Tommy Montana, 560 Mercedes, Rolls Royce, Hoops, The Color Purple, X-Clan, The Police, Magic Johnson Lakers jersey, Converse, Rakim, Audi, and Slices of Pizza. And now we begin part two of the chapter, the Tupac section. We'll start with characters of the Tupac section. The Boy, and that's Tupac, Marion Afini, Cynical, Cynical is Jada Pinkett, Maya, Maya is a composite character, Yosef, Cheris, The Agency, and Federales. Cultural references in the Tupac section, Greyhound, That's Incredible, Yodi Kudu, LL Cool J, Swatch, and DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Maryland, the Tupac section begins. After Tupac graduated middle school, Afini moved them to Maryland. This somewhat begins the part of Tupac's life that we somewhat know about from the films like Tupac Resurrection. Tupac didn't fit in on the streets of Baltimore, where they weren't feeling MC New York, but he found a place where he belonged in a school for the gifted, the Baltimore School of the Arts. This section of the chapter involves Tupac's interactions with Maya and Cynical, and Cynical is Jada Pinkett. Authors that Marion Afini recommends to the boy. W.E.B. Dubois, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Leroy Jones, Frederick Douglass, Margaret Walker, Gwendolyn Brooks, Langston Hughes, a poet like Langston Hughes, you can't lose as a cruise all on the expressway. John Dryden, John Milton, Jean-Paul Sartre, William Blake, Horatio Alger, William Shakespeare, and that's his favorite, Sir Francis Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon is sometimes thought to be the real William Shakespeare, along with Christopher Marlowe, and Herman Hesse, who I guess is the author of Siddhartha, and uh, mentions Henry the Henry the Sixth by Shakespeare, and Shakespeare is like I said a, re- a recurring theme with Tupac. He mentions it in Tupac Resurrection. If you look at the name Tupac Shakur, it's kind of Tupac Shakespeare, Shakur Shaker Shakespeare. And then enter the composite character of Maya, the love interest for the boy. So we have her appearance with the scent of hyacinth. Curly reddish brown hair, curly reddish complexion, gold hoop sticking out of her nose, bitten nails, which might be from um, Just Like Daddy, throwing blows at the popos, breaking your nails, glowed like an angel with broken wings, staring at life through an empty shell. Then we have Maya, the rumors that she was a monster, called the Black One, blood drinker, can swallow a man in one gulp. Used to be a dancer in California until she almost killed her husband. Mother was from Goa and father is African. A slut. She has an STD, sexually transmitted disease. Another New York baby dreaming about living the good life, but already behind when she got there. She had the undesirable job of closing the library. That's not a, that's not a rumor. That was true. And no one hangs out with her. She's around 19 and believes in weird stuff and believes in Zoroastrianism. Maya, according to Maya, mother's Indian, a Hindu from a lower caste family, doesn't know much about her father. He died when she was around two. His people were from what used to be Persia. He was a mix of African and Iranian. Her parents met in New York in the 60s, and she takes medication. And so I guess as a composite character, she could be the you know, hypothetical girl that appears in many of Tupac's songs. And so like all of Tupac's girl stories all into this character. Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is one of the world's oldest monotheistic religions. It was founded by the prophet Zoroaster in ancient Iran approximately 3,500 years ago. Much of Zoroastrianism, including leading characteristics like messianism, were inherited by or otherwise influenced later religious systems, including Second Temple Judaism, Gnosticism, Christianity, and Islam. It was gradually marginalized or otherwise absorbed by Islam from the 7th century onwards with the decline of the the Sassanid Empire. Recent estimates place the current member of Zoroastrians at around 2.6 million. 
so based on this, it's like the, the original religion that everything else spawned out of. Maya and Tupac. They spend much time in the library together. They're both from New York, she being from near Broadway and the Avenue of Americas, and Tupac being from Harlem, the Bronx. They both had dossiers on each other prior to meeting, like they both knew about each other. Tupac decides she needs a friend and promises to not leave and to take away the pain if he let me. It's like a, just like daddy. Maya asks what she should call Tupac, and he says, you could call me daddy. Their relationship is described in the song, Just Like Daddy, from the Machiavelli Don Cluminati album. She also references Until the End of Time. And there's also a reference to Temptation. Temptation is on the All Eyes on Me album, I think, if I remember correctly. Maya defines Tupac. She thinks that he is a seeker, an explorer of everything, volatile, sensitive and tries to hide it, likes danger, forever talking about getting riches and bitches, but doesn't really know what he wants, lost, and also in love with cynical Jada Pinkett. Jada and Tupac. She picked Tupac to perform a music video for Fresh Prince's Parents Just Don't Understand. Fresh Prince is now known as Will Smith and is Jada Pinkett's husband. And that's, that's so bizarre. Uh, just, you know, when you see that her and Tupac were dancing to Fresh Prince and then she wants a Baron Will Smith, that's, that's, that's bizarre. I mean, that's great. I'm happy for them. But just at the same time, it's just, you know, Will Smith, I wonder if he ever met Tupac. They, they, they're totally opposite spectrum kind of guys. But uh, in fact, I know Will Smith knew of Tupac because I, I saw, I think he was being interviewed for the movie Ali. And he had gone to Africa. And they said, what, what do you remember most from being in Africa? And he said, Tupac and Biggie. And they go, what? He goes, yeah, I was in some real, real uh, poor, poor location where they lived in like huts. And carved on the wall, it said Tupac and Biggie. And he said, he's like, you know, it just blew me away that Tupac and Biggie were known in this remote area of africa where they didn't even have tv sets or stereos to even listen to music and they knew of tupac and biggie and he, he had wanted he had wished that like a better influence had crossed the seas you know maybe his albums i don't know that's i think that's kind of wrong that he kind of dissed tupac being that you know that's jada pinkett's old buddy but at the same time maybe he was claiming his shine even though it's easy to Talk when someone's not around. But I'm cool with Will Smith, aside from all that Illuminati weird stuff, Scientology stuff. But, you know, it's cool that he makes albums with no bad words, positive. At least his public persona is good. You know, whatever he does outside of that, that's his business. I'll never forget Jada Pinkett. Uh, first time I saw her was in Menace to Society. I thought she did a great job acting in that. That was That was pretty big movie too you know that's another Tupac connection because I think Tupac was supposed to play the Muslim guy in that movie based on the interview with Mo Prem, Shakur and even the Alan the Hughes brothers in fact, if you guys haven't seen the Hughes brothers interview and it was just with I think Albert Hughes it's interesting when he retells the story of uh, getting in the fight with Tupac because he says that he ended up holding Tupac's chain and that wherever he goes angels roll with him so it was, it was quite mystical. You don't fully understand the situation of the fight. I mean, you know, a bunch of guys jumped one guy. So that's, that's kind of that's kind of cowardly. You know what I'm saying? You should fight somebody one-on-one. -on -one. But, you know, whatever the case, I'm not hating on Pac. I'm not hating on the Hughes. Whatever. Whatever happened. It's too bad that they didn't get along better because they could have done a lot of good stuff. Uh, but anyway, as Alan Hughes retells the story... He mentions like some real paranormal stuff happened that he doesn't remember what happens. All he knows is that he wound up with Tupac's chain and Pac had a bloody lip. And I'm I'm retelling his side of the story, not because I I don't care about any sides. I really don't. What I care about is that he said that he's got angels that roll with him. And I just wonder what that really means. So... And the fact that, I mean, if he got beat down by a bunch of dudes and he still is around to tell about it, you know, something something mystical must have happened. I'm just saying. You know, as we do this book, we're exploring the mystical. So that's a mystical interview. I think it was on The Breakfast Club or it was on Sway. It was on one of those two where they interview uh, one of the Hughes brothers. 
And I did hear Mo Prem's side with when he was talking to DJ Vlad. He, they just thought that the Hughes brothers kind of disrespected Tupac back then because Pac put him on for the Brenda's Got a Baby music video. Uh, but anyway, it was interesting hearing the guy talk. Uh, again, I'm not taking sides. I'm I'm just reporting. Uh, the Hughes brother also said that that they were the only people Tupac ever apologized to publicly. Even though that's not true. I know Tupac said he apologized to others. You know, what's neat too in that interview is that the Hughes brothers were saying that when Tupac came in and when he's acting all kind of nutty, that he was supposed to be the heir to Denzel Washington, that he had been selected, and that John Singleton was like selected to be the black Scorsese. You know, in context of people being selected and all the Illuminati type stuff, it was just an interesting thing to hear said, and then you just have to like fill in the blanks and figure out what he really meant. It, and like I said, don't fear the the interview because of you know you're supposed to hate the Hughes brothers because you're siding with Tupac. You could learn a lot from the interview. It was interesting, and that was a wild tangent. Let me get back on track. So T- Tupac thought the song was corny. It said that in the book, and the song he was referencing was I'm, I'm guessing parents just don't understand because we did see that footage in the resurrection uh, documentary of Jada and. Tupac dancing to uh, Jesse Jeff and the Fresh Prince. <laughs> Tupac thought the song was corny. Jada and Jada was Tupac's conception of love. He wrote poetry to her. She read poetry to him. They shared commonalities. Two poor black kids in a school that catered to rich white ones. Both of their fathers were gone. She looked out for Tupac and kept him up with his studies and life. At the end of the chapter, Jada feels that Tupac was too involved with Maya. I just wonder what that means. Don't you feel bad? I mean, that that was a perfect couple right there, man. I mean, Jada Pinkett and Will Smith just seem strange to me. Jada Pinkett and Tupac, that makes sense. But, hey, man, I'm not hating on Will Smith, so. I, I always thought Will Smith was hard when he made that song Freaking It. Where he goes, yo, my last check for Wild Wild West came on a flatbed. Once and for all, let's get this straight. How do you measure a rapper? What makes an MC great? Is it the sales? 20 mil. Is it the cars? Bentleys. Is it the woman? Jada. Is it the money? Psh, please. Mr. Clean, yet the fact remain. Got girls that don't speak English screaming my name. All you rappers yelling about who you put in a hearse? Do me a favor. Write one verse without a curse. And I think he said that he had more Grammys to fill a chessboard. So here's the Will Smith standing up to all the gangster rappers. That was, that song didn't get much airplay, but when I heard that, I was like, man, that is, that's pretty hard. They go, yeah, they said I was soft. Yeah, Microsoft. Tupac's view on the American dream. He saw all of his mother's dreams not come true, and he didn't want to be a dreamer. He wanted it to be a reality. And it references White Man's World from the Seven Day Theory album. It breaks down his perceived flaws of the Constitution or how it only applies to white people. He felt lied to and abandoned. Disillusioned lately. Indian references. Zervan Akarana. Infinite time. Similar to God in the Bible. Zervan created two lights. Ormazud, wise and kind, the greater one, presides over all that is good, and he wanted to make Persia and the world into a paradise. And then you have Araman, the lesser light, tore his way out of the Zervan's womb to begin an evil reign. They say whenever people have doubts and fears, or wherever there is laziness or poverty, that's Araman, or the angry man, Angra Menu. The Amisa Spentas, holy immortals, are like angels. They help keep us on the right path. Ahiraman has his devatas, and they're always out to get you. If you let them, they'll have you believing that the sun doesn't shine and that the sky is never blue. Reminds me of demons. There is a war going on between them. Both sides use whatever means they can to influence people. You have to know which one is guiding you. And I refer to this as the dual legacy. The dual legacy of all things. That's my company. 17 songs called Gathas that you're supposed to sing to praise God. Samsara, Ocean. Kwa, Kawali, Music. Shimamil, and Lilac. 
Jogan, Maya's grandmother, was a Jogan. Her mother didn't have the gift, said Maya wouldn't last. Jogan is a Hindi word, which is actually a female counterpart of a Jogi or a Yogi. That is a monk, someone who doesn't believe and use worldly things and tries to keep him away from worldly pleasures. You don't have to be a Jogan to see things. Yoga means to yoke, to bring together the mind, body, and spirit. When it's done properly, the veil of illusion is lifted. After that, anything is possible. The weeks, 2-8. to eight. Week 2 is 112 mysteries from the Book of Secrets. Does anybody have the Book of Secrets? What are the Book of Secrets? Week 3 references I Get Around by Tupac and Digital Underground. Maya urges Tupac to become a rapper and to rap about real life and words of wisdom in week four. Week five, Pac wrote. Week six, she read, he wrote more. In week seven, Maya teaches Tupac to breathe. In week eight, Tupac has a vision induced by Maya. So what do the eight weeks mean? Anybody got an idea? I don't know. There's, is it the chakras, the eight days of creation? I don't know. I don't know. Anybody? So anyways, got some guesses. Drop the eight-week theory. Prana, your vital energy, your flow, a.k.a. Mulungu, the Holy Spirit, the force. Hatha Yoga teaches life is the period between one breath and the next. A person who only half breathes, only half lives. He who breathes correctly acquires control of the whole being. I swear this past week I've been taking more deep breaths than I've taken in a long time. I don't want to half live. I want to breathe correctly. I don't want to half breathe. I want to fully breathe and breathe correctly. And I want to acquire control of my whole being. I got to get back to meditating. But I got to make all these videos, man. Week eight. Revelations come when you don't expect them. Clear your mind and your senses. Don't hear, don't smell, don't feel, don't want, and don't think. Just let it be. There's, there's parts that describe the song Picture Me Rolling. Described how he let the lyrics flow in the love he received. As he explains to Maya what he saw, she draws out that he also must have seen the opposite. That love cannot exist without hate on this plane. The yin and the yang. The duality. The void Upanishads, where heaven and earth meet, there is a space wide as a, razor, as a razor's edge or a fly's wing through which one may pass to another world. In the void lies the gate to another realm. Your true calling lies on the other side of that gate. It mentions that when they kissed, their dreams and fears became connected. But there's so much truth in that revelations come when you don't expect them. You gotta let the force flow. And it's hard because we want to be in control of our lives. The golem. The golem. Those who dwell without form in the lower planes are there to frighten you. They claim to possess the keys to the gate, but they lie. The key is available to all who are brave enough to use it. The golem film is recognized as the source for the Frankenstein film. Excerpts 29, 30, and 31. They're all from the song... Shine On You Crazy Diamond by Pink Floyd. I can't find any snippets that I'm authorized to use for Pink Floyd, so I'm going to use Kendra Morris's performance of Shine On You Crazy Diamond. Since excerpts 29, 30, and 31, Shine On, You Crazy Diamond, and Kendra sang it. I mean, Pink Floyd really made it, but uh, I'll take this time to plug Kendra Morris. 
She's a rising star. She's got a version of Shine On You Crazy Diamond. It's available on Amazon. She was in my, in a group I was in, a member of the hip hop, rock, new metal band, Superfly Crew that I used to be back in college in the late 90s. She's got a bunch of music videos and songs available. Uh, she's got an amazing voice. You really ought to check her out. And check out Superfly Crew too, because they're still doing it. And they were the evolution of Lyrical Fusion, which was uh, my rap group from the 90s. And then uh, myself and 808 Pimp became part of Superfly Crew. And actually Papa Frito, who was from Underground Dwellers that came before Lyrical Fusion, um, we all joined with Eddie Machete and Kevin and Charlie and Chris and created uh, Superfly. And Superfly was the bomb. They were like Linkin Park before Linkin Park. And Kendra was in Superfly. She sang smooth groove music and 32 Floors. And, and she, was, she used to just jam out on a lot of the other tracks. So smooth groove music was the bomb. Man, Superfly crew, it's just a shame the whole world hasn't heard the Superfly anthology. It's freshly dipped. At the time, Superfly was the newest, coolest thing. I, I, it was so awesome that I was a part of it. Um, and what it became was even was even better because I just I couldn't bring it on the level that it needed to be brought. So they found excellent MCs to replace me. And um, it was voluntary, you know, uh, dudes always had love for for what I was doing. But I just couldn't do that night in, night out. My throat just gets just gets hammered and my ears get hammered. But anyway, Kendra Morris, Superfly, Lyrical Fusion, Underground Dwellers. Th this is what what I was doing in the 90s and I was an artist in the 90s at the same time with Tupac so if anything Tupac was competition <laughs> with me uh but yeah we never hit Tupac status one day though one day and one of the things we did was we created the first VCD album so every track on uh Freshly Dipped the Superfly album had a music video for it and that was before DVD I was the only one doing it um, so Superfly was just innovative, just like everything else we were doing at the time in the late 90s, at the beginning of the World Wide Web. It was just an amazing time. From 93 to 99 to 2003, a decade, you couldn't tell me I wasn't going to be famous. It, it's, it's a shame that I'm not, but it's okay. It's part of the plan. But uh, we innovated. A lot of the stuff that happens today, I think, came from us. We're definitely innovators, so... It was awesome. It was awesome. The Lyrical Fusion, The Final Toast, was the first internet rap album. We were the first internet rap group. And around the world knew about us. And we were multicultural. And uh, we just, we, sh we our, everything we had going was just perfect for the time period. And it's just a shame it didn't blow up bigger. But things happen. They happen like they happen. If you want to hear some of the old stuff, I keep uploading it as I find it. It's on youtube.com slash user slash dual legacy. So as I as as some of the guys from the past send me stuff, I upload it. Um, it's only a partial collection. Our total collection is over 400 tracks, countless videos. The videos would be endless. We made movies, music videos. We did everything back then. Before, before YouTube, there was no YouTube in the 90s. There wasn't even YouTube in the early 2000s. YouTube came out like around 2004, 2005. So uh, we had already been done with it before the rest of the world was able to catch up. So we're like Andre 3000, a millennium ahead. We're ahead of our time. It was too bad. Hey, but you know what? One of us made it. Kendra Morris, she made it. She's famous. So that's the show. Superfly. We, we ride on through Kendra. Go Kendra. Chapter conclusion. Tupac and Maya hook up at their hotel room. It's the Alexandria Hotel. I'm not sure if that's a real hotel or a reference to the library at Alexandria, being that she was the library closer. So Tupac awakens at 2 p.m. and finds Maya gone. He finds a message written on the mirror in lipstick. It seems to be a message that he impregnated her and a prophecy of his future, you know, where it said the seed of the future has taken root in the present. And there's other references like Immortals, Devantas, Angry Man, Strength. So, you know, maybe that's where one of Tupac's hidden children came from. Anyway, there's just so much to say about it. Let's just read it. It says, Dear Daddy, the seed of the future has taken root in the present. Believe in it and follow that path to your destiny. Many will wish death upon you, but many more will come to love you. Love is God. God is your strength. Don't give in to angry man or the Devantas. 
and look to the immortals for guidance as we've looked inside each other. Remember, I've seen your spirit. Yours is the greater light. What are you waiting for? Shine, Diamond. Be the legend you were born to be. And that's another reference to Pink Floyd, Shine On, You Crazy Diamond. And made me think of Rihanna's song, Shine Bright Like a Diamond. And that brings us to the song of the week, The Sacrifice by Jonathan Lippi from the album Mind Over Matrix. The lyrics to this song that I wrote and recorded in 2004, so that's 11 years ago, blend the stories of Nas and Tupac in this chapter together. It's available to stream free on YouTube and elsewhere, or you can get the album Jonathan Lippy Mind Over Matrix on Amazon or CreateSpace. This is one of my favorite songs I ever recorded. I wish it was three verses. It's only a single verse because the beat just got all crazy, and uh, I just let it flow from the soul. That shape, the raw events in people's lives that change. Sometimes for the good and sometimes for the bad. Sometimes you wonder about the life you could have had. Had you made a different decision about your path? Sometimes we get too caught up thinking about the past. Or spending too much time wishing with someone else. If you don't like who you are, you need to change yourself. Realize you're the gift and that you are with God. My name is never reflected if I'm who we are. You are a star and you need to learn how to shine like them. Such a sacrifice I might not sound like them, but it's important. Yeah, I'll see you in 1987. There was too much material in this chapter to cover in depth, so make sure to post your research and links in the comments on the things I missed. I know I said I'd keep it short, but who knew this 1986 chapter was going to drop it like it did. So I'm still, my goal is to keep it under 15, but, you know, sometimes things happen. I've read up to 1987. A lot of a frequently asked question I get is how far into the book am I? And I'm at 1987 right now. I've read 1987, so I'm going to make a video on that pretty soon. At 87 is going to be short, I can tell you right now. So yeah, I'll see you in 1987. Thanks for watching. As always, be on the lookout for The White Book by Machiavelli. And I'll see you in 1987.